All right, it is warm. This is the surface of the sun. It's the hottest place on earth. Jesus. Yeah, if you couldn't tell from that, I want to get one thing out of the way at the very beginning of this review. Everywhere, everywhere, I've tested the 28 to 200 millimeter F2856 DI3 RXD from Tamron. Has been the hottest place on the planet. All right, guys, that might have been a slight exaggeration, but not by much. If anything, it proves this lens has a very high melting point. Anyway, thanks a lot for joining me for this review. Again, this is Tamron's 28 to 200 millimeter F28 F56 DI3 RXD. It's their latest addition to their all-in-one type of telephoto lenses for Sony full-frame mirrorless. The last one being that 70 to 180 millimeter F28 VXD that I loved so much. If you haven't looked at that review, I've got two different versions of that, a short and long version. Go check that out. I love that lens. That being said, and possibly because of that, it doesn't happen often with my reviews, and I'm maybe shooting myself in the foot saying this at the onset, but I can't tell if I like this lens or not. I'm kind of in an unbridled meh on this uh, 28 to 200 millimeter. I guess that means that I don't not like it, but at the same time, I don't know. Some lenses just click with you, uh, some don't. This may be the latter, but I have enough information here, literally every point on this lens that I could test. I have tested it and I'm gonna show you so you can make your own decision about it. So first of all, I'm gonna tell you all the pertinent specs about this lens, compare it to a few others. I have a ton of sample pictures from you. I have a lot of on location footage from shooting in the Outer Banks, the middle of North Carolina, all over. I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but it was warm. So yeah, let's take a look at Tamron's 28 to 200 millimeter F28 F56 and see what's what. First of all, let's talk about the form factor of this little guy here, and it is pretty much a little guy. I mentioned that in some other parts of the review that are coming up. So looking really in depth with the specs here, this is of course Tamron's 28 to 200 millimeter F28 56 the i3 RXD. The model number is the A071. It has 18 elements in 14 groups. It has an awesome 0.19 meter minimum object distance. That's 7.5 inches on the wide end. That is how close you can get to your subject from the sensor to the front of the lens. On the telephoto end, that's the 200 millimeter side, you have a 0.8 meter, that's 31.5 inches minimum object distance. So with this lens, you can get quite close to your subject and still have it in focus. One thing that gets talked about a lot with Tamron's new lenses is their um, contention to stay with a 67 millimeter filter thread size. Personally, that doesn't bother me at all. I use virtually all 77 millimeter filter sizes. So I throw a step up ring on there. I'm literally shooting right through the sweet spot of the filter. I don't have to worry about any big netting really. And that could really come into play with this lens. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later too. So all of Tamron's new lenses for Sony full frame mirrorless, that's the 20, the 24, and the 35 millimeter. Those primes that I've reviewed, those budget primes I like so well, they all have 67 millimeter filter sizes. The 17 to 28 millimeter F2.8, the 28 to 75 millimeter F2.8, the 70 to 180 millimeter F2.8, and now the 20 to, excuse me, the 28 to 200 millimeter F2.8 5.6. They all share the same filter sizes. So. Again, that could be a good or a bad thing for you. I think it's a good thing, but it is what it is. Dimensionally, this lens is quite small for the telephoto capacity it packs in. It is 4.6 inches long. That's 117 millimeters. Compare that to the 70 to 180 millimeter and you're shaving off about an inch or so. You have a 5.9 inch overall length for that one. That's 149 millimeters. Believe it or not, this lens is exactly the same size as that 28 to 75 millimeter F2.8. That one is 4.6 inches, exactly the same length. Same goes for the weight. This lens is considerably lighter than I thought it would be, especially for all those elements that they pack in there. It is 20.3 ounces. That's 575 grams. 
roughly the same weight as that 75, excuse me, that 28 to 75 millimeter F2.8. That one is 19.4 ounces, 550 grams, and it's considerably lighter than the 70 to 180 millimeter F2.8, 810 grams on that one, or 28.6 ounces, which is understandable seeing how that lens squeezes in a full stop of light compared to the 28 to 200 millimeter. Something that you will notice though, this lens only has seven aperture blades. Those other two lenses, the 70 to 180 millimeter and the 28 to 75 millimeter, they're all nine aperture blades. So I guess if you're a portrait shooter or if you're really concerned about the bokeh, that may have a technical concern, the technical aspect for you. Personally, I haven't seen any difference between those two aperture blades. So we'll just have to, so that's something you'll have to decide for yourself. Personally, I haven't noticed a difference with those two lacking aperture blades. Uh, if you're a real technical stickler that you think that's gonna give you some better bokeh, uh, who knows, of course, that's your decision. I'm not sure exactly why they chose to leave those out. It might've had something to do with uh, keeping this the form factor down. I really don't know. Of course, you do have the front and end caps, naturally, and a flower-shaped lens hood included with this. You know, if you watch any of my other reviews, I'm weirdly specific on my lens hoods. I like a good lens hood. What can I say? I'm that kind of guy. Anyway, I noticed during my shooting, especially beginning, for whatever reason, I had trouble taking the lens hood on and off without looking. Generally, I'm pretty good at that. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think they've changed anything. I think that was just a one-off for me, but who knows? Uh, yeah, the lens hood does what it does. I don't know why I had such a hard time in the beginning taking it on and off, so there's that. Just walking around the lens here before we get down to the pith of the review, you'll notice it does have a lens lock on there. It's very, very solid. It's good for a lens like this. To avoid any kind of drift, I don't think you would really run into that, even if you were walking around with this lens all day, like on your stra camera strap. But it's there, and uh, it works really well, so that's nice to have on a telephoto. You'll notice that it has a two-step telescoping uh, little barrels here. Usually lenses like this maybe have one, or maybe that's just in my mind. But uh, the zoom ring works really, really well. It's just that right combination of stiff and uh, looseness. So it's a zoom ring, it does what it does. The same thing goes for the focus ring here. It has a full-time manual override. So if you're in autofocus mode, you can manually focus and tweak. We'll talk a little bit about the autofocus later too. One thing I do want to definitely mention on this one, the weather ceiling that I'm always going on about with Tamron's newer lenses really bailed me out this time around. I was out on the Outer Banks this lens really got rained on. I'm shooting with my A7R Mark III, downpour type rain, it functioned flawlessly. Now I'm not one to intentionally abuse my gear, but in those situations, weather sealing can really make the difference uh, on whether or not you not only come home with the images you want, but come home with undamaged gear. And last but not least, folks, I caught a lot of flack on the announcement video for the 28 to 200 millimeter. For whatever reason, uh, for not dwelling on the MTF charts. I'll tell you now, guys, I really don't give two shits about MTF charts. I'm more about the practical functions of a lens, not just looking at a chart. Uh, and that wasn't even a review, so I don't know what the deal was. But sorry, guys, if you want to see the MTF charts for this lens, you can look at those for five seconds right now. So now that all that stuff is out of the way, folks, let's get into the actual good part of the review. I'm gonna show you all the places I shot with this lens, tell you my thoughts as I was out there shooting in the real world, and then we're gonna move over to the computer and take a look at all the sample images I have for you. I think I've got 105, 106 sample images for you to look at. Uh, we're not gonna look at all of them, but the important stuff. And I did a dedicated test on the vignetting of this lens because when I was out shooting, like I said, looking at the back of the camera, it's hard to tell anything about the distortion, anything really pertinent about the vignetting. Normally, I don't pay too much attention to vignetting on lenses nowadays because I generally add that back in with my post-processing, but this one might have had enough for me to be concerned about, but you be the judge of that, so I did a dedicated test nonetheless. 
All right, guys, let's get into uh, the rest of the review here. Good morning, folks. Adam Welch coming to you from the Atlantic Coast this time. Hopefully you can hear me. Wanted to give you some first impressions here on location of the new Tamron 28 to 200 millimeter F28 F56 DI3 RXD. This is their newest addition to their Sony full frame mirrorless telephoto lens lineup. I just came off testing that awesome, kind of watch out for the waves here. That awesome 70 to 180 millimeter F28. Uh, that was absolutely amazing. I love the autofocus. I've been shooting up and down the coast here. I've uh, been up to Hatteras. I'm here at uh, Kill Devil Hills now, headed up to Nags Head and uh, Kitty Hawk, that kind of place, you know. Anyway, uh, so far, uh, I like the lens overall. I can tell the autofocus is not nearly as snappy. This has the RXD autofocus, which is fine. But like I said, coming off of that uh, VXD autofocus from that 70 to 180, uh, it's just not the same. But like I said, I've only been working with it for a few days. Um, we'll take a better look at the uh, sample pictures and talk more about the specs, that kind of thing. But it's a very easy to handle lens. I have tested out the weather ceiling quite a bit. It's been raining down here uh, on the East Coast of North Carolina quite a bit. And uh, it really has seemed like it's held up pretty well. I don't know if the tide's coming in or what, my God. But anyway, wanted to give you the first impressions of this new 28 to 200 millimeter lens from Tamron for Sony cameras while I was thinking about it out here on the beach. So I uh, hope you enjoy the view. So I don't know if you can hear me or not. We have a way down to the northern end of here at Corolla. Okay guys, the reason I'm stopping here, the video was already done. I finished it up. I wanted to go back and put this in as a disclaimer an explanation, a reason, a caveat maybe for what you're about to see. We didn't know at the time that in some areas of the Outer Banks you're not allowed to walk on the dunes. Uh, I looked up things before I went down there. That never popped up. I had to dig for it and find it before I posted this video and the language is still very vague. It says that in some places you're not allowed to walk on the dunes. Again, didn't know. Let me explain to you exactly what happened. We parked, walked down the road to where the pavement ended and the beach road begins. Went through a gate there. No sign saying don't walk on the dunes. Saw the first beach access. Followed the trail down to the surf. Went through another gate onto the beach at Corolla. No signs that we saw saying don't walk on the dunes. We actually walked past two sheriff's deputies parked in Jeeps right there at the gate. Went down maybe another five, six hundred yards. We could still see them. I'm sure they could see us. We saw some tracks going up the dunes. We walked up to the ridge line of the dunes. That's where we stayed. Uh, again, I didn't know that that possibly might not be allowed. I still don't know if that was allowed. I would never intentionally do something to harm the environment that's against the regulations there. I'm that guy that picks up trash and stuff on the trail. So I don't know. But uh, anyway, the reason I wanted to tell you this is because I don't want to propagate any damage to that area uh, especially the horses there because you see something that i did and like i said i still don't know if it was right or wrong uh if it was wrong sorry guys it was completely unintentional but uh yeah i want to throw this in here i hope you enjoy the rest of the video here and the parts you're about to see so i don't know i don't know if i was right or wrong walking on the dunes in that particular spot so in the words of hunter thompson i either owe an apology or nothing at all Try to find some horses. Uh, it's a bit windy. Again, I'm here with Tamron's 28 to 200 for Sony. And found this girl trying to enjoy a lunch and trying not to bother. So yeah, at least a success. There's a little fold down behind her. 
I can see it asleep, so we may ease around and see if we can't, again, not disturb them, but get a little bit better look. Okay, I think I've uh, got what we came here for, really. There they go. Very cool. Hey folks, I am currently back west from the Atlantic coast, been shooting out there on the Outer Banks. Got some pictures of the wild horses out there in Corolla. So I've been shooting with that, as you know, the 28 to 200 millimeter Tamron, their new telephoto for Sony. Uh, I've got a few concerns, namely, there may be some vignetting and some distortion on the long and short end of the focal length there. I hadn't had a chance to get all those pictures on the computer yet to really look at them closely, so I've just gauging this off the back of the camera. Uh, anyway, I thought the lens deserved at least one more day of dedicated location shooting, that kind of thing. So I'm headed up here to this little park uh, to shoot a little bit more with it, tell you what I think about the lens thus far. So far, it's been really good for what it is. Like I said, I can't really judge the uh, overall image quality just yet, but of course we will. Uh, so yeah, we want to take this lens out one more time, shoot with it, and then tell you some of the pertinent specs and uh, my opinions, and like I said, some of those concerns that I've had uh, up to this point. So, let's get to shooting. So I was 100% relieved to find this, actually got a nice little creek running through here to get out of this infernal heat. Um, I'm actually gonna shoot a little bit. I'm gonna show you those pictures too, but I wanted to run down a few of the specs of this camera. But first, I'm gonna show you the few little pictures I took here around the creek. So let's talk about this little guy for just a second. And it is fairly little, I have to say, for the amount of zoom it packs in. As we've stated 50 times before, this is the 28 to 200 millimeter F2856 DI3 RXD from Tamron. It is for full frame mirrorless cameras. Again, form factor quite small. It is 4.6 inches long, 117 millimeters. That is uh, without the lens hood, which we'll talk about here in just a second. It is quite light, extremely light, if I can say so. It weighs only 20.3 ounces, that's 575 grams. It's worth mentioning that this is about an inch shorter. And weirdly enough, this is about an inch shorter than Tamron's 28 to 75 millimeter F2.8, that other medium range telephoto that I tested a while back. And it's actually weird because this 28 to 200 millimeter is about an inch shorter than that awesome 70 to 180 millimeter I tested not long ago. It has a 67 millimeter filter thread, as do all of Tamron's new full frame Sony lenses. A very impressive minimum object distance. This one has a 7.5 inch minimum object distance at the wide end, that's 0.19 meters. And at the telephoto focal length, it has a 31.5 inch MOD, which is 0.8 meters. And that is three inches closer, or you can get three inches closer on the wide end than you can with that 70 to 180 millimeter F2.8 and two inches closer on the long end than you can with that 70 to 180 millimeter F2.8 that I love so much. Like I said, guys, I'm gonna get more into the particulars of this lens when I get back in the studio. Believe me, we're gonna pixel peep, look at all those pictures, talk about the specifics of this lens a lot more. But overall, I have to say, um, I'm kind of in a meh stage so far on the 28 to 200 millimeter it's not that i don't like it it's a very budget friendly all-in-one lens but like i said right now i just don't know i'm a little concerned about the vignetting that 
Sorry guys, ran out of space on the memory card all of a sudden. Anyway, uh, I'm a little concerned about that vignetting that I uh, saw, like I said, at least on the back of the camera, it seemed like actually at the long end, the 200 millimeter end, it seemed to be darkening quite a bit at the corners. Again, I've got to where I really don't mind that so much, but uh, given as it is so prominent, we're really gonna test that out when we get back to the studio on my seamless background, white paper, and uh, really see how bad or maybe not as serious that vignetting is. Another thing was the uh, distortion on this. It does take advantage of the in-camera stabilization on the Sony a7R 3 but I still at least, um, just again, looking at the back of the camera, it does seem to have some barrel distortion at 28 millimeters. That may be the case. It may not be. I was there at the coast. There's a lot of lines intersecting, so it may not be as bad or as prominent as I'm thinking it is. What else? What else? Um, overall contrast, been okay. I've been shooting in uh, raw mode, of course, so it's a little bit soft. The sharpness seems to be okay. It's nothing that's just blowing me away, but the sensor is 42 megapixels, so any kind of shortcomings in a lens, this is definitely going to show up more on a higher resolution sensor than it might on some other sensors. So there's that to consider, but I can guarantee you, like I said, we're going to look at all these sample pictures when we get back to the studio and really pixel peep to see just how sharp or not sharp this bad boy really is. Okay, I'm going to shut up. Uh, this really is a pretty nice spot, by the way. I'm going to shoot just a little bit more here. See a little butterfly over here floating around somewhere. Oh, one thing I will mention while I've uh, got it sitting in the background here, this is going to be like a dual review outing. I'm testing out this uh, new small ball head from the Colorado Tripod Company and their new quick release plate. So that's going to be another review coming up. So just, you know, you know what I'm shooting out here with. All right. Well, there's that butterfly. All right, let's get back to it. Just really quick, I want to do a test. Um, like I said, I've been shooting in RAW, but I wanted to test out how this would look in the in-camera JPEG. So I'm gonna shoot off a raw picture, which is this one. And next, I'm going to change us over to JPEG and fire off the same picture. You can see I have it um, on extra fine. Same picture again. And we'll compare those next i'm going to show you where in the focal range we uh, start to see those aperture transitions like i said we're at 2.8 uh f 2.8 at 28 millimeters and that's going to shoot down to f 5.6 at the long end 200 millimeters so let's just see exactly when that changes in real time so here we have f 2.8 at 28 millimeters and I'm just going to slowly zoom in, and we'll just watch for the change. All right, that's F3.2. I'd say that's somewhere around, I don't know, 32 millimeters. Zooming in some more. There's F3.5. Call that about 48 millimeters, 48 to 50 millimeters. F4 somewhere around 60 millimeters. F4.5, about 85 millimeters or so. F5, call that about 120. And there's F5.6, I'd say that's somewhere around 145 millimeters. And that's the uh, aperture you're going to have for the rest of the focal length range. I'm going to do a quick video test here just using the camera's audio. I've got the camera set up on a tripod. We're at uh, 28 millimeters right now. It's filming at 24 frames per second, 150th. This is at F1, uh, excuse me, F10. ISO 250, in case you're interested in that kind of thing. So 28 millimeters. Have the autofocus in on AF continuous. There's all the way in to 200 millimeters. Pretty decent, if I may say so, as far as the autofocus goes. Zooming back out. Let me 
We got a car coming here. We'll see if this will track very well. All right, not bad. Finally back here in the studio. Thank God. I've got a little test device to evaluate that possible vignetting that we saw on the 28 to 200 millimeter F28 F56 from Tamron. As you can see, have the seamless white background, the paper background pulled down here, which is being illuminated by the wide open bay door. Now, what this is going to do is give us more or less a one to one ratio of illumination from the uh, light source to the background so we shouldn't have any real fall off at the corners, the edges or anything as we would with a smaller light source. So any vignetting we see is probably gonna be due to the lens. So a few specifics for the test. What I'm going to do is start off at 28 millimeters. We're gonna go through the aperture range, probably gonna go half stop. So we're looking at F2.8, F4, F5.6. Um, move to the halfway focal length point, so about 85, 86 millimeters on this 28 to 200 millimeter lens. Go through that aperture range again, zoom into 200 millimeters, go through the aperture range again, and see what we get. And just to show you, I made one quick exposure. What I, uh, I metered with uh, my little camera app, of course, on my phone, uh, at the center of the paper here, that gave me about 1 25th of a second at F2.8. Gonna keep it at ISO 100. And that's the results from that there. So more or less, I would call that a decently exposed image. If I was shooting at ISO 100, which I probably wouldn't be doing here just for the lighting conditions, uh, I'm on like a portrait subject or something like that, that would be a real world exposure. If I'd metered something out in the field, that would be a real world exposure. And since we're going to be looking at a plain white background here through all the pictures, I wanted you to know that that's what an exposure made at those settings would look like. So real world situation, hopefully give us real world results. Still hot. Okay, let's get going. Oh, one more super quick adjustment I just made. I went in and took that lens hood off just in case so uh, we don't have to worry about any weird shadows making their way around the corners. So there's that. So now we're down to the actual really important stuff here when it comes to the Tamron 28 to 200 millimeter F2856, and that is the sample images. Like I said, we're looking at about 106 bad boys for this lens. Uh, so let's just jump right in here. We're going to cover the images I made from the very beginning all the way to the very end. I've only called out a few of them. I have went through um, over the last couple of days and processed a few. I'll show you the before and afters there as well. Some of these are JPEGs. Some of them are raw. You can see all the settings right up here at the top left of the image, but I'll try to more or less commentate as we go. So starting off here, I thought I had the camera in raw. These uh, first five photos here were made in, uh, six photos rather, were made in JPEG mode. This is Pilot Mountain, awesome place in North Carolina. We're looking at this first photo, 28 millimeters f5.6. Again, JPEG, pretty good. This is at three to one, that's at one to one, and then of course that's the entire photo, but look here, you can see these three vultures, we call them uh, buzzards down here in the south. I think these are actually condors, but I don't know, I wasn't up there. Uh, yeah, you can see a lot of detail. You can actually make out the beak of one of them. Again, that is at 28 millimeters, these are JPEG. And this is when I first started, at least to maybe think, there were some vignetting issues here. I really uh, jumped up the shutter speed here, downed, or rather uh, opened up the aperture to f2.8. You start to see a little bit of softening here at the corners. Keep in mind they are JPEG, and you're starting to see a little more darkening here at the corners. Darken that down if you look over here to the navigator you can see that corner darkening just a little bit nothing just crazy but you can tell there was a little bit of vignetting there going from 28 millimeters all the way in same vantage point 
to 200 millimeters, you can see the telephoto power of this lens. Yeah, that's at f5.6, one four thousandth of a second, so it really froze that motion. We're going to talk about the sharpness a lot of this lens, but uh, overall, at any rate, even with some of the issues we're going to talk about, that's pretty passable, folks. Uh, you can see the head of this bird. You can see his beak. You can make out the tip of his feathers. And you uh, can compare that to the 28 millimeter. I mean, that's quite a zoom. I'm trying to see if I could see. Those are those birds at 28 millimeters. You can see them there. They swoop down to the side of the mountain. And now, 200 millimeters, zoom that in. That's really going to be all the sharpness any normal person probably is going to need. This is a wide shot of some railroad tracks, 28 millimeters F5, another sweltering day. I had switched over to raw on this one. So these are going to look a little more flat. Right out of camera still, the color's good, great contrast. The detail, and this is where that MOD, that super close MOD comes in handy. This is at 200 millimeters. Uh, it was handheld, so we're looking at it somewhere around 31.5 inches. Really close to this train track. Right there in the center, you can see the details on all that old steel. Very nice. Now here's a picture that I've already processed. This is the reset it here. This is the raw version. Bump that up some. This is a puddle right next to those railroad tracks there. So raw process. Excellent capabilities of that Sony A7R Mark III and this lens just showing you a um, reference view. Here's the one I processed. There's the original. Big difference there obviously. Here's some of a few flowers. This is again raw 80 millimeter f5.6. Beautiful there. Very nice color too, I have to say. Here's that one, uh, let's see, f8, 200 millimeters. Very good detail on this little leaf. I love those reflections. We're going to talk about this a little bit more, but this lens possibly has an issue with some forward focusing, but we're going to get that when we get ahead of ourselves. We're going to get into that a little bit later on. This is uh, moving east in the state. This is the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. As far as I know, the biggest lighthouse in the United States. They actually moved this at some point uh, around the turn of the millennium. It's kind of wild to think about. Anyway, uh, I guess I was about, I don't know, maybe... 9,500 yards away from the lighthouse here. This is at 28 millimeters. Looking here, it's slightly soft, at least to my eyes. You can make out the textures in the lighthouse just fine. It's not overly soft by any means. This is at F4. And then zooming in to 200 millimeters from the same vantage point, you can actually see the raindrops on the very top of the lighthouse glass. Again, pretty sharp here. You can see the little outlines of the brick there up top. So I'm thinking maybe it's just slightly soft here so far at 28 millimeters, at least on the wider end of the aperture. That's F4. Of course, this was stopped down to F5.6, which is actually the widest aperture you can shoot at 200 millimeters, which is very interesting. Another shot of the lighthouse, this time uh, from underneath. This was 81 millimeters, f4.5. Again, you can make out the little mortars, mortises in between the bricks, that window. 28 millimeters, 197 feet tall, this lighthouse is. So you can actually still get in a good bit of wide angle scope with this lens too, which is very interesting because it is technically a telephoto lens. They call it an all-in-one. So that shows you just how much of a field of view you can fit in with a 28 millimeter. Little detail shot of the side of the lighthouse here. This is at the base. 70 millimeters, f4.5. All of these are handheld, by the way. Take a look at the corners. 
Maybe a little bit of softening there. Okay. Close up of one of the windows. All right, doesn't look too bad, honestly. Maybe I've been too hard on this lens just in my initial evaluations. You can see the streaking on those window panes there. Yeah, sharp enough. I mean, if that's uh, if that's a thing, definitely sharp enough. Moving on down the beach, call this guy the long border. Appreciate him. My God, this is at 200 millimeters, so I'm actually a good ways away from him. But uh, I've got a feeling he saw me taking his picture, but public beach. This is another one of those photos I ended up processing. Where are you? This one here, excellent photo of this gentleman. Uh, there we go. Yeah, call out with long border on Cape Hatteras. The original photo, this is the raw version, uh, 200 millimeter f5.6. Man, 164 hundredth of a second. All right. And this is the one process, like I said, I give my little film wash that I do. This kind of resembles some push Kodak Tri-X 400, maybe push the stop or two. Of course, it's digital. Then toned it a little bit in Photoshop. I think it works pretty well, but then again, it's my picture. And this is a crab. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Crab. This is what I was talking about again uh, with the possibility of some front focusing. We'll see this on some more pictures. I was using the flexible spot autofocus uh, zone on my A7R Mark III. I'm virtually 100% sure that I had the spots mid body on the crab. It was stationary. And we can see that it's focused, albeit very sharply. It's focused just a little in front of that, and I actually have a real-time um, shot where I show where the autofocus point is, then I'll show you the picture to where you can tell the focus point was in one location and then the focus was in another. Now, keep in mind, you can micro-adjust this lens. Uh, I did not do that, so I don't think that's going to be a big issue, but out of the box, I think it is front, fo uh, front focusing just a tad. Cape Hatteras Lighthouse again. Uh, this time from the surf. Uh, another picture that I ended up cropping and processing. Very, very much again a film look. I think it works pretty well. This was later on that night at Kill Devil Hills down on the beach. Not too long, uh, too far from where we were staying. Uh, now that it matters about the low light capabilities, that's more or less to do with the sensor. But this was 30 seconds f20 ISO 100. That's at 200 millimeters. Tripod, of course, even with the uh, good bit of noise from the sensor. I mean, I don't say a good bit of noise. I mean, you know, it's a thousand eyes. So uh, it's very clean. I have to say, of course, this is raw. Sharpness is great. Contrast, again, very good. I ended up uh, processing this picture, which was taken right after it. These beachcombers here. Didn't have to do much. That's the process. And this is the raw. So right out of the camera, pretty decent, I have to say. There's another one from the beach that's raw with the seagrass and the, um, I don't know, guys, what do you call these? These little, <laughs> uh, I know I've seen them for snow drifts. So I guess that does the same thing for sand. Yeah. Great contrast. Again, great color, really. Right out of camera, they were shooting fireworks down off the beach. Bring in some of that exposure. It's a 200 millimeter, two second f5.6. And this was the next morning, uh, lifeguard tower. I think I had a little bit of haze in because, again, it's balmy as hell out there. Very humid, very hot. And I think I don't, I didn't let the camera and the wind warm up enough from the air conditioning before I went outside. But, you know, bringing that contrast, make a little clarity. And that's um, bring the highlights up. Yeah, decent picture, I have to say. Uh, just for one off the hip like that. Looking at the detail of this uh, float, that's F5.6, 200 millimeters. You can make it out just fine. Um, I was focusing actually on that. Another example of maybe just a slight forward focus. So I think it's safe to say this one was forward focusing a little bit. This is at the widest aperture at 200 millimeters. You're seeing a little bit of that vignetting coming in. Bring it back to raw. Um, 
Yeah, you can see those corners darkening, especially in the navigator, just a tad. And it's hard to tell if these focal lengths, what is just depth of field, blur, and softening. I think that's a little bit of softening. Because in the middle you're not seeing that um, not seeing that very much at all. Yeah, just a little softening there. Which that's at the extreme aperture of that focal length, so that's not just, you know, that's to be expected really in most lenses, if not all lenses. This lighthouse, I cannot remember the name of it. It was down there towards the north end of the, the Outer Banks. I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of it. Let me know down in the comments. I know somebody knows. But uh, anyway, this is 28 millimeters f6.3. You can see the raindrops. Of course, it was raining, as always. You can see the raindrops coming down off the lighthouse and dropping in through these trees, so sharpness is great there. I focused on the trees here. And I've already seen this, and I want to show it to you as well. You can see this tiny drop of water, of rain coming off these leaves. So yeah, I mean, in retrospect, I know I've already talked about uh, not liking this lens, and honestly, at the time, uh, I was leaning towards that I didn't, or at least I didn't have any strong feelings. But just looking at these pictures here, all the ones that I've shot, I think the sharpness is at least acceptable, if not pretty good. Okay. These are the wild horses of Corolla there on the beaches. So this young lady, you I didn't know it at the time, but uh, you can see her little fold asleep right back here. We're at quite a distance here. This is 200 millimeters. Again, you can see the sharpness of uh, the grass hanging out of her mouth. Didn't mean to disturb her lunch. One eight thousandth of a second f two eight at twenty eight millimeters. Same settings there. There's at fifty two millimeters f three five. Excuse me, that's actually f three five one eight thousandth. Some of these corners. Very good. Great contrast just out of the camera, too, I want to mention there. It's amazing how much different these images, and these are some of the images that I was the least impressed with and thought I'd saw the most flaws with on the back of the camera. This is one, too, uh, where at 35 millimeters, I can distinctly remember looking at these two back to back and thinking I was seeing some distortion. Uh, you can see how the horizon line kind of drifts up. Um, hang on. I'm starting to think this is just because we have these lines of the beach. We have the line of the horizon. We have the line of the dunes. We have the vertical lines of the grass. Uh, yeah. Let's go to crop. And let's just draw a line from one corner of the horizon to the other Yeah, you can tell that's kind of scooping up just a little bit with some barrel of distortion. Reset that. Let's be thorough here. I'm going to go down to lens corrections. There's not a profile as of this recording in Lightroom. This is Lightroom Classic. Uh, here we go. A version of this 921. I think there's a newer version, a uh, newer build that I haven't installed yet. So it may be in that, but in this version, there is no profile for the 28 to 200 millimeter. Let's just go to manual distortion. Yeah, a little bit of barrel distortion there. Nothing major. I'm going to try to correct it manually. All right. And keep in mind that's at, uh, what did I say, 52 millimeters? All right, much better. So it can be corrected. There is a little bit of distortion there. Um, I haven't noticed anything like pin cushion distortion, which can actually be a good thing with a lens. If you're doing portraits, it can make the, port the person look slimmer. But I haven't noticed any pin cushion distortion um, so far, at least. 
You can see this little guy woke up. Twenty eight millimeters F thirty five. These are all grossly underexposed for whatever reason. My fault there. 185 millimeters F71. I think we're seeing a pattern here, guys. Uh, so far, sharpness seems to be okay. We've run into a little distortion towards the short end of the focal length. Nothing crazy. Especially when we get a profile built into Lightroom here. I actually really, really like that. Alright, let's just cover out of the black and white. Huh. Get a free lesson in black and white conversions here while we're at it. There we go. Let's bring that blue down just a tad. And another quick tip, uh, something I love to do, transform, I add a quick border inside of Lightroom. Yeah, I can throw that over into Photoshop and that may be a decent picture. So uh, yeah, we'll see. Anyway, beside the point, uh, different video. Sorry guys. We got a few more of these little guys here. Brighten you up, fella. Oh yeah. Beautiful at 200 millimeters, f5.6. See these little whiskers? See the sand in these little whiskers? All right. All right, enough of the horses, guys. Sorry, well, okay, maybe one more of this little guy here. That fellow. 200 millimeters. F5.6. I think definitely, um, especially on the longer end of the focal length, as you're getting closer to 200 millimeters, the wide aperture, the widest uh, aperture that you can have around that focal length, somewhere around F5, F5.6, uh, much sharper than it is at the wide end of the focal length, at around 28 millimeters at F2.8. A little soft, maybe. Uh, I think maybe stopping that down to F4, if you're on the, the wide end, it's going to help you out a lot there. And again, be sure that uh, you check out your micro adjustments for your focus, because apparently this does forward focus just a little bit, at least on my model. But it's like a fingerprint. You know, you could get a lens that's perfect out of the box. You can get the lens after that, and it's not perfect out of the box, and you have to adjust it. But that's just part of the joy of making pictures in it. Okay, so here um, I had some pictures of this seagull. I had this in uh, AF Continuous uh, trying to track this little guy. I just fired off some shots. I didn't have it on burst or anything. Uh, it tracked pretty well. I think I should have had it on like wide and then AF Continuous. This was on just the spot, so I like tried to lock on to him with that. Followed. It did pretty well under the circumstances. Um, not just the best light. So you see a little blur. Then we... So I'm quite locked on to them, getting a little bit better. And keep in mind, guys, this is 200 millimeters handheld, f5.6. You can make out the little highlights around his eyes, his beak, actual individual feathers. So we're at this point, uh, we're kind of nitpicking a little bit, but this is a massive review. Oh, that's much better. Uh, and that's what we do. <laughs> we're going to really look at everything that you might not even care about, just so you know. So I don't think really uh, it's going to be any issue with the tracking if you actually have the settings set correctly in your camera for what you're going to be doing. Have a monopod, tripod, put it in pan. I think you're going to be okay. I will say that this lens, um, it does take advantage of the in-camera stabilization. In my case, I have A7R Mark III that I was using here. That's a roughly five stops of stabilization. And hypothetically, it takes care of the vignetting and the distortion and the chromatic aberration. But we saw there's still a little bit of that lingering. But as far as the stabilization, I think we're spot on. It's not quite as... Um, 
in my opinion, as good as that 70 to 180 millimeter that had the VXD autofocus. Uh, this has the RXD. RXD is in the majority of the lenses, as far as I know, that VXD was just introduced with the 70 to 180 millimeter for Sony full frame mirrorless from, uh, from Tamron. I fell in love with that one, so I may be a little bit biased now uh, to the VXD over the RXD, so keep that in mind. This is another picture uh, we saw when I was uh, trying to not melt out there in Little Creek. You can see in the video where I was focused uh, right here, as best as I could tell, right on the center of the leaf. It is sharp there. You can actually see a little, little bug sitting there, a little happy bug. I didn't move anything, um, but we can see it started to maybe forward focus just a little bit I had this on um, autofocus single shot so I didn't I was depressing the shutter it was focusing again each time so I think it focused a little far forward these reflections might have had something to do with that but given what we've seen I think it was just it's just an issue of front focusing which is not uh, anything detrimental uh, let's say 28 millimeter f5.6 wide angle Perfectly fine. Another shot from the video. This one was really impressive. I looked at this earlier. 68 millimeters, f5.6. Some dude's hand. Who knows? But you can see, this is what's really impressive. One one thousandth of a second shutter, so it froze that really well. You can see little tiny bubbles from where I immersed my hand in the water. Hairy knuckles, sausage fingers, all that stuff. See my fingerprints. I think that's all the sharpness any practical person would need. Uh, that's that's pretty good. These are just a few other pictures. Another example of possibly front focusing. I was trying to focus on this little dragonfly type insect. And you can see it's focused a little far forward there. This is where I intentionally shot a RAW and then a JPEG photo. So I'm going to go to reference view. Let's see, JPEG on the right. Let's get that raw up there on the left. I'll pick a spot here just to look. I want to zoom in and then zoom in on the same spot. Bring that back to one to one. Again, JPEG on the right, extra fine, shooting at 42 megapixels, the full uh, full resolution of the JPEG. Uh, standard everything else, standard contrast, standard sharpness, and then. Um, the one on the left here is just a straight raw image. Honestly, not too much of a difference. You can see a little bit uh, the worming effect, you call it, due to the sharpening out of the camera with the JPEG. The color and the contrast, really, I mean, especially just glancing at it, not too much of a difference. You can see some uh, more detail in the shadows on the JPEG. Of course, that's more or less processed in camera. It's a little sharper. I don't think there's really much difference in the contrast, uh, really, um, or really the color for that matter. I think this one seems more vibrant on the right, the JPEG, just because of the increased shadow detail. And then uh, the highlights seem to be brought down just a little bit as well. But that's to be expected from a JPEG. Overall, um, this is one of those lenses with A7R3 that, you know, uh, given the situation, I would probably just shoot JPEG. Um, yeah, I think you'd be just fine, really, in most uh, most circumstances. All right, uh, so those the uh, those were the field shots. Uh, let's move on to the ones uh, the actual vignetting test that we did here in the studio. This is me, that picture I was talking about that I made with the settings that I metered of my hand. You can see that's decently exposed. I mean, it's of course the lighting is you know terrible, but. Uh, Decently exposed, at least from a technical standpoint. I'm going to start off here with the 28 millimeter, 125th of a second f2.8. This is at the wide end of the focal length. We're going to move from f2.8 through the available aperture range. And you can already see there is some vignetting, especially uh, taken into account here in the navigator. You can see it's more warm up top, cooler at the bottom. That is just uh, inherent for my studio. It's great for portraits. It makes great skin tones because the uh, ceiling of my studio, the rafters and everything is bare wood. It's kind of orangey, makes a warm glow. 
and the floor is concrete. So you get kind of cooler here, warmer up top, but you can still see as we move through, there's some darkening that gets better on the periphery as we go through or stop down the aperture. This is at f5.6, f8, there's f11, f16. So if we go from, go back to our reference view, we have f16 on the right at 28 millimeters and we have 28 millimeters at f28. You can obviously see the improvement here at f16 with the vignetting at least. Very nice to see a direct side-by-side -side comparison. I know I'm not exactly crazy when I've seen that vignetting while I was actually shooting out there. So uh, let's see. Uh, I guesstimated. I tried to get around 85 millimeters, folks. I was 14 millimeters off. I'm sorry. But uh, this is about the halfway point between 28 millimeters and 200 millimeters. And I did the same thing again. So let's go back to our loop view. This is uh, 94 millimeters. Uh, F4.5 was the widest aperture I could get there. And the results are basically as you would expect them to be. Uh, you're starting to lose a lot of that obvious vignetting. There's F11, F16, and I think I either has something on the lens or hopefully not something on my sensor, but I can see a little, little guy hiding out right there. Yeah, so that's F16. Excuse me, that's F22. That's the smallest aperture I could go down to um, as we increase the focal length. So there's F22. Bring us in the reference view. There's F45 on the left. F22 on the right here. I don't really see very much vignetting at all to speak of. And like I said, that's not something I really care about these days, but I thought I was seeing it so prevalently that I wanted to do a dedicated test just to know for sure. Okay, uh, just to close out, uh, let's look at the 200 millimeter focal length. This is 200 millimeter at the widest aperture f5.6. There's f8, f11, f16, 22. And at 200 millimeters, you can stop all the way down to a quite a narrow aperture, f32, uh, relatively. Just to show you the difference, uh, look how easy you can see that little speck of dirt or whatever that is. Uh, hopefully, that's on the lens that I can clean off and not on the center. But uh, again, anyway, I've, uh, I'm rambling again. So reference view, f6, uh, excuse me, f32 here on the right. Brighten that up just a little bit. And then we have, where is it? Okay, 200 millimeters F5.6 versus 200 millimeters F32. You can see a little bit, I think, with the F5.6 as far as vignetting. I mean, it's, it's negligible, guys. It's not really <laughs> bad at all. Um, and virtually non-existent as you stop down at each of the focal length ranges. So vignetting, forget what I said about it. True, it is there a little bit, but not nearly as prevalent as I might have thought. Okay, let's go ahead and sum all this up. Is it possible for someone doing a lens review to dynamically change their opinion on a lens mid review. Could it be that this lens is actually better than I originally thought it was when I started off doing this evaluation? Have I actually learned something myself? Have I somehow managed to change my own opinion? Why am I asking you? In short, yeah, I think I have. When I very first started this very video, before I had looked at all the pictures from the camera, as it turned out, I think the majority of the images that I was worried about, the ones that I thought had a lot of vignetting, the ones that I thought had a lot of distortion, the sharpness issues that we talked about, I think those may have just been one-offs. I really don't know what to say about that. This lens is much sharper than I thought it was. The distortion is nowhere near as pronounced as I thought it was. Same thing with the 
vignetting. Overall, very impressive little lens. Yet again, from Tamron, the price of this guy, I think I checked today, was $749 US, somewhere around there, somewhere around $750. The 70 to 180, that's about $1,199. So we call that $1,200 bucks. This one is uh, $750. So you're looking at somewhere around $450 so-so difference in the price between this telephoto and that last telephoto that I was so in love with. My favorite things about this one mainly, number one, the size. It is extremely light. Like I said, it's about the same size of that 28 to 75 millimeter f2.8. I'm not overtly wild, um, honestly, with autofocus. Like I said, that VXT autofocus absolutely ruined me on that 70 to 180 RxD. Totally capable, totally fine. It just doesn't have that wow factor that the VXD autofocus did. And I think that really goes for everything about this lens. It's a good little lens. I actually like this lens. I don't love this lens. I mentioned at the beginning of the review, some lenses you just love uh, while this performed just fine uh, throughout the test, honestly. It's just not one of those lenses that I thoroughly enjoyed. That's just me. You may absolutely love it. It's a very subjective opinion as far as that kind of thing goes. A lot of the other reviews I've watched and read, people are raving about this thing, saying it's one of the best lenses they've ever used. While it's certainly not that, uh, in my personal opinion, I don't think that you're going to be disappointed in it. If you're looking for a moderately priced, it's not cheap by any means, $750 is $750, but if you're looking for one that's not in the thousands of dollars for your Sony full frame mirrorless camera, and that will actually work on the crop sensor mirrorless cameras as well, I think it would be a good option for you. Um, if I had to choose, if you had the money, I would definitely go with that 70 to 180 F2.8, the uh, DI3 RXD that I did those reviews on, but if not, I think this one would be perfectly serviceable. Believe it or not, at the very beginning of this review, when I was kind of iffy over the quality of this guy here, I was possibly going to recommend going with, uh, if you wanted to stay with Tamron, going with the 70 to 200 F2.8, putting an adapter on there. But right now, I don't think that would be a viable option when you compare the differences probably in the autofocusing with an adapter over a native mount lens like that. But you know, that's still an option for you. Uh, you know, if you can find a cheap, cheaper used 70 to 200, uh, F2.8, whether it be Canon, Tamron, uh, I think I've even tested Sigmas, maybe? Anyway, uh, again, I'm kind of getting off the topic. Overall, guys, final verdict on the 28 to 200 millimeter F2.8 5.6. If I could change one thing about this 28 to 200, it would be that uh, just keep it maybe at a constant F4 aperture. I don't think in this case that F2.8 is helping you out just a lot, unless you do maybe a lot of uh, night sky work on the wide end of the focal length spectrum where you want a little bit more in terms of uh, low light capabilities. Overall, I think I would have really liked this better at uh, 28 to 200 F4, something like that. But, you know, everybody's got an opinion, right? Final verdict on this guy, I don't think you're going to be disappointed. I wasn't nearly as disappointed as I previously thought I was. The images turned out just fine for the price point of this lens. Like I said, $750 for a new all-in-one lens. Uh, strictly speaking, that's what this is. Great weather ceiling, passable autofocus, sharpness is just fine, contrast is just fine, color straight out of the camera. The raw files look great. Of course, it supports the in-camera, if your camera has it, your in-camera image stabilization, your chromatic aberration control, your vignetting correction and distortion corrections. If you have all that, that's going to work with this lens. I know these reviews are lengthy, guys, but I promise I'll put a little condensed version on here, too. I just really love taking you along with me, showing you me, testing these lenses. Uh, I think you get more out of that than just somebody sitting here regurgitating a bunch of numbers, MTF charts that kind of thing. I hope you like the image samples. If you, uh, again, have any questions, comments, you know where to put those. So uh, until next time, guys, I'm Adam Welts. Thanks again for being here. Still can in them.